Uh oh, you've done it again. You have stumbled upon a milestone video. This is installment number 20.0 of Robin Steve's Traditional Knives Anthology. This might be a bit of a long one, my friends. You might want to pause this during the title. Maybe go get yourself a hot or cold beverage, depending on the weather where you are. Maybe a little bit of a snack, something to put your feet up on. You know the drill. We've got some rare and desirable eye candy from Great Eastern Cutlery. Stick around, my friends. Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 6 October 2016. Yes, this is the night Hurricane Matthew is going to collide imminently with the east coast of the state of Florida, specifically somewhere around West Palm Beach or Melbourne. And Melbourne is the hometown of my partner in the TKA series, Steve Denton. How about the truth? Steve has, as of about 3 o'clock this afternoon, relocated about 60 miles inland to a friend's house. He has some crazy idea about returning home about 6 p.m. tomorrow to survey the impending damage. I'm thinking he might not get back that quick. So I thought, you know what? While we're all praying for Steve and his mom and other residents of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, Let's just sit down and do a traditional Knives Anthology video. We have in front of us this evening 11 examples of the rarest of the rare in the 10-year history of Great Eastern Cutlery. And I'm just going to let Steve's text handle it from here. Hey Rob and hello everyone. It's been a while. So I thought we would do a special episode to discuss my favorite aspect of collecting factory traditional knives. And that is the extremely rare knives. If a knife is a desirable pattern and brand that's in mint or near mint condition, it is the rarity that increases its value in the market, not the age as it may seem. For example, if, if 50,000 of a specific pattern were released in the year 1910, the odds are fewer of these knives will survive as near mint or mint knives today. Conversely, if that same number, 50,000, were released in 1950, naturally more should be available today. So it only appears that age is a factor in their value, but in reality, it is their rarity that drives the speculative market. Technically, all Great Eastern Cutlery knives are rare compared to any other factory knife brand in human history. And I suspect many folks still don't grasp that fact. An average run of case knives in one pattern, one handle material today, averages about 3,000 pieces. Compare that to the same average run of GECs at 30 to 75 pieces. But then there are the sleepers being quietly made by GEC that are incredibly rare with no special announcements. No other factory has done it like this in history. Remember, we're not talking about custom knives by custom makers. So let's dive into these. It should also be noted that Bill Howard and his master artisans have been quietly and tactfully releasing such rare gems for going on 10 years now. 
ever since GEC was founded. And you don't have to be quote unquote an expert to get your hands on these pieces. You simply have to pay close attention. The best part of it all is that these ultra rare knives do not cost a dollar more than the same pattern in any normal run. Of course you will pay more for the finer more exotic natural handle materials such as stag, ivory, abalone, and snakewood, but that's to be expected. <clears throat> Another interesting note is the fact that these rare knives will fall into several different categories in which they were made under various circumstances. We will cover each one of these categories as we move through and discuss each knife. So sit back and enjoy 11 of the rarest of the rare because it is highly unlikely that you have or ever will see most of these jewels, let alone get your hands on one. Brought to you only on Rob's great channel. Some of them may not be your favorite pattern, but that's not the point. All of these knives were truly made for different uses in the past. They had true purpose. All brought back from the grave, we should at least appreciate them for that alone. Okay, let's clear the table. and get into these knives. First, the first category for super rare GECs is really no specific category at all. They were simply a part of a standard run or even a special factory order in which they happened to include one handle material or another that was very few in number. The first knife we have here is the number 47 Viper. The Viper debuted in February of 2014 in both the Tidute and Northfield brands. This particular Tidute Viper is from that run and is the second rarest Tidute Viper ever made. It has GEC's exclusive Frontier Bone handles and only 11 were produced. Incidentally, the rarest Titty Viper was done in mustard jigged bone and only one was made. I own 12 or 13 Vipers in all three brands with most coming from that first release and all in different handle material. Several of my other Vipers are extremely rare as well, but we'll see those in a future video. This is still such a gorgeous blade. Bigger than you would think. Next, let's move on. The next knife is in this non-specific category. It's part of a special factory order for Mike Latham of CollectorKnives.net. It is the 73 Farmer's Jack done in, once again, Frontier Bone and in Northfield trim. This SFO for Mike isn't even displayed on GEC's website under the collect by pattern like most knives are. But they are listed in the production totals for the year 2012. The pattern number is 734112T as in Thomas. The 4 is for the spay blade, thus called the Farmer's Jack. The T at the end of the pattern number appears not on the tang but only on the production totals and it stands for the thong tube or as we would call it a lanyard hole. To my knowledge this specific knife has never been made by GEC before or since. This style of spay blade comes from the old Remington bullet trappers and was used as a secondary blade only. But Mike and Bill decided it would make a great working blade all by itself, and I agree. It's also my favorite spay blade ever made. It's beefy, but it has a pretty good point for a spay blade. And it's dressed out nicely with that long machine swedge and match striker long pull. And of course that beautiful satin finish like Mike does all his special factory orders. 
Another very interesting point is that Mike had 51 of these made in garnet jigged bone. However, there were 14 other handle materials with only 10 or fewer knives made in each of those. They only made two of these in frontier bone. I also have another with a unique autumn gold jigged bone and it's one of only two made. The blade only wraps on this frontier bone version. Let's see if I can find it. It's very slight. Right there. But it's still my favorite, says Steve. Let's put that one away. Oh, guys, this next knife is a jaw dropper. Oh. Our third knife today is the last one to fall into this non specific category for truly rare knives. It's the number 38 Grinling Whitler Northfield version in one of the finest examples of Neptune acrylic of any in this handle material. GEC only made 17 of these, making it the rarest of all Grinling Whitlers in any brand, Tidiot or Northfield. This set of handles on this specimen are drop-dead gorgeous, Steve says, and I agree. In the right light, these covers look an inch deep, he says. Look, at, it's like that cloud shield is floating in space. Awesome. Chris at GEC personally hooked me up with this one because the rest sold out through early reserves or instantly from a dealer. I truly lucked up, thanks to Chris. She told me over the phone she was supposed to only sell this to the first walk-in customer of her little store at the factory. Why? Let's look at the center triangular spacer. Come on, focus, baby. A worker accidentally ground the corner or the shoulder of this spacer. You can see it right here for about three quarters of an inch during the final fabrication step of that part but no light passes through like a true gap would. Chris said they were too proud of this particular knife to stamp it as a factory second and no kidding. That would have been a tragedy. She was supposed to show the defect to any prospective buyer in person but charged full price. She cheated and sold it to me over the phone. Okay, thanks Chris. Uh, she did make me beg, says Steve. Oh, isn't that thing gorgeous, guys? It sure is. All right, next up. The number 85 bullet end or teardrop jack. Our next knife today falls under the category known as transition knife. This is any knife that shares parts stamped with two different years. Now most factory knife makers would release such knives almost every year. However, GEC only did this with six knives throughout their nearly 10 year history and in only one handle material each of those six times. And let's take a look at what Steve's talking about. So here's the main spear blade, number 852212. So that blade is date stamped for 2012. And the pen blade, 852211 for 2011. Interesting, huh? So the first time they did it was a 2006-2007 run, and that was in a number 23 large trapper in green jig bone called River Valley Green with two blade, blades. It was the only large run. 250 of those were made. I own one. But the remaining five times were all done in 2012 and only involved the number 85 bullet end jacks. 
and each had very few knives made. This one before the camera is the rarest of all. It has smooth buffalo horn handles. And guys, I will interject here. This knife is, what now, almost five years old. And the buffalo horn is free of cracks and shrinkage. All eight transitions from cover to bolster are dead smooth. A little tiny bit of figuring right there. Just a stunning, stunning knife. You'll notice that both blades have a complete pattern number on the pile side of each tang, only the years being different. These five different bullet end jacks are the only GEC knives ever to have two complete pattern numbers stamped with two different years on each blade except for their Congress knives, but no Congress knives uh, were these transitional knives. So because Congress knives have two each of two different blades, you'd get that stamped twice, once on each main blade. And this one we're looking at is the rarest of all. Only eight were ever made. None of GEC's transition knives were ever involved in any special factory order. Next, oh guys, I, when I opened this tube, I just about started crying. This is the number 48 Slim Dogleg Trapper. We now move along, says Steve, to yet another category that the GEC collectors call orphan knives. I don't know who first coined this term, but over the decades, other factories called this category factory cleanup knives or parts knives. In most cases, with any other factory, there was nothing special or rare about this commonly made knife. They would be exactly like other knives, right down to every detail. But we're talking about the factory knife king, a.k.a. Bill Howard. During any standard run, it's protocol to stamp out, heat treat, grind, and finish a very small number of surplus blades and springs in case of a mishap during production or warranty issues. If a worker breaks or damages a blade or spring, they simply grab another from the small surplus pile at GEC and the rest are stored away and usually after two or three years when their schedule allows, Old Bill will make some extreme rare and unique gems that were never produced before or since. This number 481211 in crushed seashell acrylic is a fine example. Would you look at that? They did make 43 of these in 2010. However, the main blade was a muskrat clip. This orphan knife has the larger western style clip, in my opinion the finest looking clip point blade GEC has ever made. And this is one of only eight made. Awesome walk and talk. Did you hear that? Smack. It's quite the dress knife, or should I say dress up knife. Next, we're moving on to a Number 73, Two Blade Scout Trapper. Here we have another orphan knife, says Steve, that's truly more special than most, if not all. This number 73 GEC has quite the history going for it, hafted in smooth cherry bone with end cap bolsters, and in 440C stainless, it is an acorn knife without an acorn. This knife represents one of the earliest knives that began having the full pattern number, that six digit number stamped on the tang. And I can't find it, it's on the secondary blade. Okay. 
Well, there are only four sides of tangs, and it took me all four to find it. So the early knives had only a two-digit number, and during 2007, there were 30 73 only acorn knives made in 440C in smooth cherry bone that came with the acorn shield and end cap bolsters. But the knife we have before the camera was made a year later in 2008 with that full six digit number, but curiously lacked the acorn shield. Why? Because then co founder and co owner of GEC, Ken Daniels, wanted it made this way. This was Mr. Daniels' personal demo knife that he carried to all the knife shows across the country. Hmm. He kept it in mint condition and eventually turned her loose to the market and it doesn't get any rarer than this, folks. It was the only one ever made. Wow. How about that? Moving on. Oh, man, it just gets more special. Just gets more special. Oh, now we move to a category officially called the factory test run knives category, including a few exceptions from other categories. The GEC factories test knives are and will be the most highly prized of all. Technically, they are the genuine prototypes, always very few in numbers, they all come with an extra label on the tube. Uh huh. Or sometimes they come with just that special label and no marketing label. And that that label is their certificate of authenticity. So this, the number 613409 Square Bolster Congress, are back from the grave gems. But only 20 factory test run Congress knives were made. These 20 true prototype knives came in three different looking glass handles. Looking glass would be a very thin veneer sheet right against the liner, and then the cover is filled with clear acrylic. I don't know if you can actually see that. Yeah, look at the pin. Okay. The other two not seen here were genuine but thin sliced black lip pearl and then one I think was sand. I have no clue what the sand looking glass looked like. Does anyone out there over 50 years old remember those yucky looking steel kitchen tables with formica tops? Mm-hmm. They were popular at least as far back as the 50s, and most common people had one with those vinyl chairs with the chrome-plated frames. They were often found in kitchens through, through the 60s and into the 70s. Shiny steel chrome-plated or aluminum legs, very cheap. Most of them looked terrible. My grandma Opal, my dad's mother, had one as her smaller secondary table in her rather small kitchen. But she also had a big, beautiful hardwood table in the dining room. Living her whole life in North Alabama, she never missed a day or night of church, and she was the most noble, hardworking woman I ever met. After Grandpa died, she still tended a full vegetable garden totaling more than an acre with help from her family and canned all of it every year. That little table saw much use and small breakfast when myself or someone else would pop in. I remember that Formica tabletop like it was yesterday. When I saw this particular knife, it gave me goosebumps. <laughs> Seriously, guys, because these acrylic covered handles look exactly, exactly like the Formica on her old table. Look at the name of the knife handles on the label. Yeah, let's look at it. What's the cover material called? Grandma's Kitchen Floor 
acrylic looking glass. Amazing. Grandma's kitchen floor. Holy smoke, says Steve. They got it very close. That doggone Formica was identical to the knife handles. By the way, they only made five of this knife with these handles. The label reads 27, but that's counting the other two looking glass handles I previously mentioned. There were 13 pieces in the black lip pearl and two in the sand and five of the looking glass grandma's kitchen floor. I have five more of this pattern in genuine stag, LVS abalone, jig bone, and red tortoise. All are rare and gorgeous, but this one gets me. And it's the second rarest Congress ever made. Oh, man. Okay, now. It takes two for this one. Next is a pair of factory test knives that are not only among the finest large Stockmans ever made by any factory, but they're truly the rarest factory made Stockmans in all history. Many of you may recall our video of my Abilene Stockman in the finest example of natural stag. These two are exactly the same knife, but were quietly released at the same time with these second cut sandbar stag handles. Interesting little story for these is only eight were made and passed out to only three dealers. Let's look at serial number 06. This one. The lighter of the two in color. As soon as they were, these were released, I noticed that only six of the eight were available. And this one was the only decent looking knife of the six. I suspect dealers kept the other two because they never surfaced. I'm not kidding. The other five looked horrible. The stag covers on both sides of the other five looked like dried salt deposits caked all up over the surface of the handles. No dealer could sell them, even though they were very rare. All five were returned to GEC, and that was that. But fast forward nearly 18 months later, and they were all five on Derek's website, Knives ship free. No special announcements were made. GEC had taken their sweet time in totally replacing those handles. And boy, were the new handles sweet. Feast your eyes on the other knife, serial number eight. Yeah, check this out. Uh, this one is really cool, guys. Not only is it the best looking stag as second cut among all six, but it's the most beautiful. And by the way, guys, this is a great knife to have in hand. Here's what second cut stag means. This is sort of the inside of the antler. You know, the outside might not have been uh, well figured. So they, they used the, the mass of the antler material and then they jigged it and possibly burned it to make it look like the outside of an antler. I think the reason number eight is cool is because the pile side cover is pretty much all jigged. The mark side is pretty much all exterior stag. Very interesting. <clears throat> so Steve says, for some reason, and I suspect rarity, the antique case knives with this second cut stag are worth more than any other handle material, including normal sandbar stag. I myself much prefer GEC's natural or genuine stag, but this serial number eight is the exception. The front cover still has most of the surface bark intact, and the rear cover is unique and beautiful in its own right. Guys, if you ever spot one of the others on the secondary market still in mint condition and with a price markup, I would jump all over that puppy because these particular abilenes are going to be worth a king's ransom in the future. You mark my word. The quality, in, the quality in every way is outstanding. These abilenes smoke even the older case stockmans. Let's see if that's true. Well, who am I to argue? Hmm. 
Hmm. I know because I own an old case, large stockman in jig bone that's still in factory mint condition. Of course he does. Okay, moving on. This is an interesting one, guys. Oh, yes. Of all the GEC knives with the prototype etched on the blade, like this, this is the real deal. All other GECs marked as proto were simply one of the regular knives pulled from the run at the end of production and simply etched as a proto. That is not the case at all with this number 53 cattle rancher large cigar stockman. Bill Howard was trying some different bone dyeing method in hopes of a color resulting like uh, to appear as an imperial jade. That would be that very translucent, very light, almost lime green jade. No other bone handles ever existed in such a unique color. Only man-made materials could be made as the color that sort of resembled that creamy light seafoam green of an old Stratocaster guitar or that similar green found in an old Chevy or Ford paint job. It seemed like a great idea, but the color would not stabilize and failed miserably. Notice the rear bone cover just to the left of the center handle pins. There is a rather clear splotch that was just getting close to the desired color. This right here. But it too faded and changed. These bone handles have actually turned darker and dirtier looking in the five years that I've owned it. And you really, it's very hard to perceive any green uh, as I'm looking at it. And the camera is giving you a pretty true representation of this color. Bill only tried to dye four sets of covers and aborted any more efforts. Only four were made, with this knife being etched as the only prototype. But they paved the way to better products in the marketplace during that development time. I also have another one of these 53 cattle ranchers in beautiful black lip pearl looking glass and the sheep's foot blade on that knife sits lower in the handle when closed being almost flush with the spine of the main blade but true to form this proto has that blade sitting up way too high when closed steve has complained about that on other models by the way i could easily grind down the kick slightly but i'm going to leave it just as it is for history and being true to its prototype nature Other than the ugly bone collar and that high riding blade, the knife possesses outstanding quality. The toughest stockman I've ever seen as a pattern, and oh so rare. Next, oh guys, we're going to save this for last because it's, I think, the most beautiful, exotic, natural handle material there is for a traditional pocket knife. Ooh. Last, but certainly not least, we have an odd category. Odd because I label this category myself. After a lot of research, I call it the Genuine Abalone Knives by GEC category. Don't laugh just yet. Here's why. I have poured over GEC's extensive production totals many times, adding up every single knife in any particular exotic handle material and pattern, such as LVS Abalone, which stands for Laminated Veneer Sheet. Not looking glass. Notice, if we can get a good shot of the sort of edge grain, there is no clear acrylic. These are laminated sheets of abalone bonded with acrylic or some resin, but it's essentially like stabilized solid abalone. Okay? Other covers would include stag, ivory, etc. And what I found surprised me. In nearly 10 years, GEC has made fewer, far fewer, genuine abalone knives than even elephant ivory. I'm kicking myself because I forgot the total numbers, but I assure you it's true. There were quite a few years where no abalone knives were made at all. 
Now, we're not talking about the cheaper looking glass abalone versions. We're talking about the real stuff. One year in particular is very interesting, the year 2011. That's the year of production for this drop dead gorgeous number 572211 BEJ dog leg. The BEJ stands for bear and jack. No end caps equals more abalone. <laughs> this is the version with the spear main. I honestly prefer the clip point main, but none were ever made in genuine abalone. Only seven of this knife were made. These seven knives, plus four of the number 62 courthouse split black whittlers, were the only knives made of abalone for the year 2011. That's 11 total knives in LVS abalone for the entire year, guys. Is that stuff not amazing? Look at the chatoyance. The way the pattern changes in the light as you move it. Oh, golly. Mm. Thank you, Mike Stewart, for the term chatoyance. <laughs> This also happens to be the finest grade of abalone I've ever seen, says Steve, on any knife, bar none. Check out the size of the chunks on both handle covers. Uh -huh. And the brilliant color they throw off. I have other genuine abalone knives by GEC, including the number 48 improved Trapper SFO for Mike Latham. They're all fantastic, but the handles are still not triple A presentation grade like the handles on this 57 dogleg jack. Several dealers told me these seven doglegs and the four whittlers do indeed have the finest abalone that Bill Howard has ever been able to obtain. Perhaps that explains why there's only seven and four made of each respectively. In a dimly lit room at night, with the soft light of a tabletop lamp mm, that sets this knife on fire with your own body between the knife and the lamp that that refracted light just makes it dance amazing I have many more of these ultra rare knives they're easier to get when you catch them right off the production line simply pay attention my friends That's all 11 of them, I believe. And that's all for installment number 20.0 of the Traditional Knives Anthology. Thanks for watching. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word is sharp. <laughs>